Hope was born in 1855, and after uh, William's death in 1872, Hope and Walter and William's um, widow traveled to Germany to continue their education. And it's in Germany that Hope trains and becomes a medical doctor. And she practices as a gynecologist in Germany and stays working there. She's also a socialist and in, again in published reminiscences, she talks about having been influenced by a teacher who'd been involved in the Paris Commune of 1871. And Hope is um, a prominent member of the German Marxist socialist group and continues her political activities as well as a medical career and marriage and family. Walter, uh, um, was plagued by persistent ill health. In qualification terms, like Mary, he attains an intermediate qualification with London University and works as a tutor of mathematics, as well as being involved and was a signator to the Socialist League, a grouping that was established by William Morris in 1885. And so I know that they both attended an early Fabian party meeting that's going round on, your, on the loop um, in 1886. So I think it's very likely that they met through their socialist involvement. After their marriage, they went to live in Harrow. Neighbours included the anarchist Peter Kropotkin. And so, it, again, it's somebody that Mary knew. And they had one son, William, who was born in 1889. By the 1890s, they're settled in West Coombe Park, which was a newly developing district of Greenwich. And there's a quote from Storm Jameson, who Mary knew in later life, the novelist Storm Jameson, who wrote two um, volumes of an autobiography, in one of which she talks about um, her memories of having met um, Mary um, as a younger woman and talks about the fact that Mary described to her the practices of her young married life. And again, that's one of the quotes that's going round on the loop. But one of the things that Mary said was that um, apparently she talked about the fact that the wives would stay put in West Coombe Park, hoping that the, um, you know, daily looking forward to the revolution and hearing that the revolution had broken out when their husbands came home from work on the evening train. Um, that's one of the memories that Storm Jameson recounts. What I want to move on now from having situated Mary in West Goon Park for you is to begin to sketch out the wider situation with regard to labour politics in London in the 1880s and 1890s. So one of the things to bear in mind then is that metropolitan problems were in the news at that moment in time. Um, London's um, politics are assuming a particular significance in the national politics. One of the factors in that was the publication of Charles Booth's Social Survey of London, in which he identified and categorised and made it extremely difficult for people to deny the extent of poverty that then existed. Um, so... There were many social commentators writing about and describing poverty and visiting the, the East End at this moment in time and visiting the slums south of the river. And these were fre frequently picked up both in the socialist press and in the national papers at the time. So the construction, if you like, as poverty as a so of poverty as a social problem is key in that time period. It's also a time period when we see the formation of Britain's first organised socialist party, which wasn't actually William Morris's Socialist League. It was the Democratic Federation that was set up in 1881 and then becomes known as the Social Democratic Federation. And they were involved against a backdrop of mounting economic problems. They're involved in organising the unemployed, amongst whom there's considerable social distress, which was made particularly acute during the very harsh winters of 1885, 1886, 1886, 1887. So there's two years that are kind of um, particularly difficult and made worse for the London poor because of a decision that was made by the poor law authorities to actually cut the levels of 
funding that they were willing to allocate to the unemployed. So you've got that context, you've got socialists organising and writing about these issues and you've got moments of great drama because alongside this you've got well publicised campaigns in order con to continue the tradition of free speech and the best publicised of those was one that um, on one occasion at Trafalgar Square, again the image is going round in your loop, where the the um, authorities sent the horse guards into the square to charge one of these meetings and it actually resulted in one death. So that's two sort of uh, three things I've described to you. Moving on, another factor that's important as a backdrop is to think about the rise of new unionism. Now what we're talking about here is an attempt to organise unskilled workers who up until that point hadn't been organised and so when we think of trade unionism until the late 1880s we're thinking of skilled workers organised in what would then have been described as the craft societies. So we're thinking of individuals like those I talked about earlier when I referred to the Nine Hours campaign and the engineers. And the first example of a uh, um, action that was taken by unskilled workers was amongst the match workers at the Bryant and May factory in the East End. They were protesting conditions and pay. One of the conditions that you were vulnerable to as a worker in the Bryant and May factory was a condition that was known as fossy jaw that effectively meant that your jaw bone, dis bone disintegrated. And again, one of the images going around the loop there is of the Match Workers Strike Committee, which features Annie Besant at the front there. And I mentioned Annie at the start of the talk. So we've got the match workers at um, strike and action in 1888, followed by, among others, action amongst the gas workers. And it's the gas workers that I particularly want to talk about this evening. The gas workers' leader was a man called Will Thorne. And again, his, his image is going round on the loop. And he wrote um, and let his autobiography in which he talked about what an exciting moment this was to be alive, especially if you were in the thick of the struggle. And if we're thinking about the 1880s and 1890s, this is Thorne at the height of his powers. He changes somewhat when he gets into Parliament, but at this moment he's still a fighting activist. And for a short but crucial period, London trade unionism became a force in in um, politics. And at this moment, again, I'm thinking the 1890s now, it's speaking through a powerful trades council, which is actually transformed in the 1890s because a number of these new unionists get elected onto and are directing policy through the trades council. Now, Mary, unusually, makes the decision rather than joining a teachers union, she joins the gas workers and they are very early on privileging educational questions. And the other thing that's distinctive about the gas workers is that they are advocating involvement in local politics. So, for example, Will Thorne himself is elected as a councillor in West Ham in 1891. So what I'm trying to sketch here is a, give you a broader picture of London politics that provide the context for Le Mary's action. And if we're thinking about, I'm now, uh, time-wise, I'm the mid-1890s, at which point Mary is acquiring a reputation in the kinds of circles that I've been sketching out. So we're thinking about a time when socialists are starting to make headway in local polit London politics, including Thorne, as I've said. And what I want to say then is that from the 1890s, the trajectory of Mary's political activities drew her into the orbit of trade union and labour leaders prominent socialists and the revolutionary activists from the Russian Empire who'd sought refuge in London. So in 1894, she is asked to stand for the London School Board for the Greenwich District, which was a huge ward. London was organised into 10 different divisions, as they were then called, um, which varied in size. The smallest was the city, which was very small and equated with the inner square mile of the city. And Greenwich, in fact, was one of the largest. And the school board division covered the parliamentary constituencies of Deptford, Greenwich, Lewisham and Woolwich. 
So what I'm now wanting to move on is to hone in on what was distinctive about Woolwich at this moment in time. I've sketched London Labour politics for you, and I want to sketch out socialist Woolwich. All of these factors were crucial in terms of thinking about what it was that facilitated her success. So, moving on to socialist Woolwich, there are several distinctive features that contributed to Labour and her success in this particular London borough. Although I should say that within the uh, political histories, she is completely ne neglected. And so her success story is absent from the success story of what was Woolwich Labour Party in the political histories. So in terms of thinking about kind of success factors for Labour in that borough at the time, one thing is this, that Woolwich was a working class community that was dependent on the dockyard, the arsenal and the military barracks which meant it had a large core of skilled workers, and it's they that provide her support base. There was a relative absence of commuters from, from Woolwich into central London, which again reinforced a sense of feeling distinct and different. Although the, the railways were the only direct route into central London at that moment in time, they'd come to the borough in 1849, because the Thames passenger steamboats had actually stopped they restart when we move forward, but at this point, they'd stopped. So if, you if you're kind of thinking about local communication links, there were horse-drawn trams that linked up the area, but if we're thinking Plumstead through and across to Greenwich. And one thing that did make a difference in terms of mobilising labour movement activity was the opening of the Blackwall Tunnel in 1897. Some th another factor that was crucial, and again inseparably linked to those skilled workers was the fact that Woolwich sustained the largest cooperative society in Greater London and the second largest in the whole of the country. And that was the Royal Arsenal Cooperative Society, members of which were crucial to her, Mary's support base. And Mary herself was actively involved in their activities um, involved in um, giving lectures, involved in chairing local discussions. And so the Woolwich, apart, um, the Woolwich Cooperative Society, apart from being a successful commercial enterprise, was also um, placing considerable emphasis on the importance of educational involvement. So what we're talking about here is a social and educational movement. And we're talking about collective, occupational, and associational cultures, again, which facilitated Mary's activism in that particular space. So there was a spirit of self-improvement in the locality, and making socialism a living reality was a way of life at this moment in time. And supporters, they had a regular speaking place, again, which is going round on your visual, which was the Arsenal, in front of the Arsenal gates in Beresford Square. And so they had regular Sunday morning meetings at which they sort of encourage and try and um, involve themselves in the project of making socialists, going back to the ideas of William Morris, that this was the way to achieve socialism. So it was this time and this place that made her political can candidature viable. The other thing that's crucial to bear in mind in terms of thinking about the school board politics is the novel nature of the school board franchise. At this moment in time, the school boards were the most democratic form of government in existence. What um, you had, they, they were open for women as well as men to contest and run for election. And women as well as men, if they were rate pairs, could vote in the local elections. And the electorate, if you're eligible to vote, you had as many votes as there were seats in, in London terms within the division. So what that meant for Greenwich was that if you're a Greenwich voter, Greenwich had four members and you could place your, all your four votes onto your chosen candidate. And what that meant was that it was possible for electoral minorities to win representation. So